For many long ages, the Pantheon continued searching the cosmos for nascent titans, bringing order to countless worlds in the process. Yet despite their efforts, they did not find any more of their kin. At times, the titans of the Pantheon wondered if their search was in vain, but always they resolved to press on. They knew in their hearts that more world souls existed, and this hope filled them with purpose. Though the Pantheon did not know it, their intuition was correct. A miraculous new world was taking shape in an isolated corner of the Great Dark. Deep within this world's core, the spirit of a mighty and noble titan stirred to life. One day, it would be known as Azeroth. As the nascent titan developed, elemental spirits roamed across the world's surface. Over the ages, these beings became ever more erratic and destructive. The burgeoning world soul was so vast that it had drawn in and consumed much of the fifth element, spirit. Without this primordial force to create balance, Azeroth's elemental spirits descended into chaos. Fire, earth, air, and water. These were the forces that lorded over the infant world. They reveled in unending strife keeping the face of Azeroth in constant elemental flux. Four elemental lords, powerful beyond mortal comprehension, reigned supreme over innumerable lesser spirits. Of the elemental lords, none could match the ruthless cunning of al Akir, the Wind Lord, he often sent his elusive Tempest minions to spy on his enemies, and so distrust among their ranks. Using feints and ruses, he would pit the other elementals against each other, only later to unleash the full fury of his servants on his weakened foes. The winds would howl, and the skies would darken with storms at his approach. As lightning blasted the world's surface, all Akir's whirlwind elementals would come screaming from the heavens, enveloping his foes in monstrous cyclones. Ragnaros, the Fire Lord, despised al Akir's cowardly ways. Compulsive and brash, the Fire Lord embraced brute force to annihilate his enemies. Wherever he went, volcanoes would burst through the world's crust, spewing forth rivers of fire and destruction. Ragnaros longed for nothing more than to boil the seas, reduce the mountains to slag, and choke the skies with ember and ash. The other elemental lords fostered a deep hatred of Ragnaros for his brazen and devastating assaults. Therizane, the Stone Mother, was the most reclusive elemental ruler. Ever protective of her children, she raised towering mountain ranges to ward off her enemies' assaults. Only after they had worn themselves thin against her impenetrable fortifications would the Stone Mother emerge, wrenching open giant chasms in the earth and swallowing entire elemental armies whole. Those who survived would meet oblivion at the fists of Therizane's most powerful servants, walking mountains of unforgiving crystal and stone. 
The wise Neptalon, the tide hunter, was careful not to fall for Alakir's schemes, or to commit his minions to fruitless attacks against Therizane's citadels. As the armies of fire, air, and earth clashed across the face of Azeroth, the tide hunter and his elementals would divide and conquer their rivals in brilliant routes. When his foes fled, Neptalon would crush them beneath tidal waves that dwarfed even Therizane's highest mountain holdings. The apocalyptic battles between the elemental lords raged for untold millennia. Dominion over Azeroth constantly shifted between the factions, each one striving to remake the world in its own image. Yet, for the elementals, victory was secondary to the conflict itself. To them, the world's calamitous state was sublime, and their only desire was to continue their endless cycle of chaos. The elemental lords reveled amid the primordial bedlam until a group of old gods plummeted down from the great dark. They slammed into Azeroth's surface, embedding themselves in different locations across the world. These old gods towered over the land, mountains of flesh, pockmarked with hundreds of gnashing maws and black, unfeeling eyes. A miasma of despair soon enveloped everything that lay within their writhing shadows. Like gargantuan, cancerous pustules, the old gods spread their corruptive influence across the landscape. The lands around them seethed and withered, turning black and lifeless for leagues upon leagues. All the while, the tendrils of the old gods wormed into the world's crust, slithering deeper and deeper toward the defenseless heart of Azeroth. Organic matter seeped from the old gods' blighted forms, giving rise to two distinct races. The first were the cunning and intelligent Noraki, also known as the Faceless Ones. The second were the Akir, insectoids of incredible resilience and strength. As the physical manifestations of the old gods will, both of these races would serve their masters with fanatical loyalty. Through their new servants, the old gods expanded the borders of their remote dominions. The Naraki acted as ruthless taskmasters, employing the Akir as laborers to erect towering citadels and temple cities around their master's colossal bulks. The greatest of these bastions was built around Yasuraj, the most powerful and wicked of the old gods. The burgeoning civilization was located near the center of Azeroth's largest continent. Yasuraj's holdings, along with the other old gods' domains, would soon spread across the world and become known as the Black Empire. The rise of the Black Empire did not go unnoticed by the elementals. Seeing the old gods as a challenge to their dominion, the elemental lords moved to excise the entities from their world. For the first time in Azeroth's history, the world's native spirits worked in unison against a common enemy. Alakir's tempests joined with Ragnaros's fiery servants, 
creating monstrous cyclones of flame. These blistering firestorms raged over the world, reducing the Black Empire's citadels to ash. Elsewhere, Therizane raised jagged rock walls to corral her enemies and shatter their temple cities. Neptalon and his tidal minions then swept in, crushing the Naraki and the Akir between unyielding stone and the fury of the seas. Yet for all their fervor, the elementals could not topple the Black Empire. No matter how many Naraki and Akir died, more and more would spawn from the old gods' putrid forms like larvae from a hive. The Naraki and the Akir engulfed the land like an unstoppable pestilence, shattering the elementals' forms. In the end, the old gods enslaved the elementals and their lords. Without the native spirits to counter the Naraki and the Akir, the borders of the Black Empire crept over much of the desiccated world. Perpetual twilight descended upon Azeroth, and the world spiraled into an abyss of suffering and death. Meanwhile, in the depths of the great dark beyond, Agrimar continued his quest to eradicate all signs of demonic influence. His battles led him from one world to another, from one demon-beset civilization to the next. Though Agrimar bore the full weight of this task alone, his resolve never wavered. He believed with all his heart that Sargeras would one day return and see that the Pantheon's cause was right. It was during his long and lonely journeys that Agrimar sensed something extraordinary. The tranquil dreams of a slumbering world soul billowing across the cosmos. The Song of Life led him to a world that the Pantheon had not yet discovered, a world they would later name Azeroth. Nestled within the world's core was one of Agrimar's kin, one far more powerful than any yet encountered. The spirit was so mighty that Agrimar sensed its dreams even through the din of activity that rattled across the world's surface. Yet, as Agrimar drew closer to Azeroth and beheld the world, horror seized him. Void energies shrouded the world's surface like a layer of diseased flesh. From the ruined landscape rose the old gods and their black empire. Miraculously, the nascent titan spirit remained uncorrupted, but Agrimar knew that it was only a matter of time before it succumbed to the void. Agrimar sought counsel with the rest of the pantheon, informing them of his discovery. Clearly, this was proof that Sargeras had been right about the Void Lords and their plans. Agrimar urged the other Titans to take action with all due haste before Azeroth was lost forever. Aenar was quick to champion Agrimar's cause. She compelled the other Pantheon members to think of the world's potential. If brought to maturity, this new titan could exceed even Sargeras's considerable might, she argued. Indeed, it would become their greatest warrior, one capable of neutralizing the Void Lords 
once and for all. But more than that, Azeroth was one of them, a lost and vulnerable member of their family. The Pantheon could not abandon their own sibling in the clutches of the Void Lords. Aenar's words stirred the hearts of the rest of the Pantheon. They unanimously agreed to save Azeroth no matter the cost. Agrimar formulated a bold plan of attack. All members of the Pantheon would travel to Azeroth and purge the Black Empire that had claimed it. They would not, however, take action directly. Due to their colossal forms, Agrimar feared the Pantheon would irreparably damage or even kill the world soul. Instead, he proposed creating mighty constructs to act as the Pantheon's hands and prosecute their will against the Black Empire. Under the guidance of the great forger Kaz Garoth, the Pantheon crafted an army of enormous servants from the crust of Azeroth itself. The Aesir and the Vanir. The Aesir were fashioned from metal, and they would command the powers of storms. The Vanir were formed from stone, and they would hold sway over the earth. Collectively, these mighty creatures would be known as the Titan Forged. The members of the Pantheon imbued a number of their servants with their specific likenesses and powers to lead the rest of the Titan Forged. These empowered beings were called the Keepers. Though they would develop their own personalities in time, they would forever after bear the mark and abilities of their makers. Amon Thul gifted some of his vast abilities to High Keeper Ra and Keeper Odin. Kaz Garoth bestowed his mastery over the earth and forging to Keeper Arcadeus. Golgoneth granted keepers Thorm and Hodir dominion over the storms and skies. Aenar gave keeper Freya command over Azeroth's flora and fauna. Norganon lent a portion of his intellect and mastery of magic to keepers Loken and Murmuron. Lastly, Agrimar imparted his strength and courage to Keeper Tyr, who would become the greatest warrior of the Titan Forged. With this new army molded from the world's crust, the Pantheon went to war. The time to shatter the Black Empire and free Azeroth from its malign influence had come. Led by the Keepers, the Titan Forge slammed into the Black Empire's northernmost holdings. The resilience and strength of the Pantheon's armies made them an unstoppable force. They unleashed the wrath of gods upon their enemies, scouring legions of Nuraki and Akir and sundering their temples. The arrival the Titan Forged caught the old gods completely off guard. They reeled into response to these stones and metal skinned invaders, but they were determined not to lose control over Azeroth. To reassert their dominance, the old gods called upon their greatest lieutenants, the Elemental Lords. The enraged elemental lords and their minions beset the titan forged on all sides. Ever wary of a fighting unified elemental army, 
the keepers resolved to divide and conquer their enemies. Thus, they split their own forces and dispatched each group of Titan Forged to make war on a specific elemental lord. Tyr and Odin volunteered to confront the most destructive elemental lieutenant, Ragnaros the Fire Lord. Their battle raged for weeks, engulfing the land in fire and magma. Yet the Keeper's resilient metal forms kept them safe from Ragnaros's fiery onslaughts. Through sheer strength and force of will, Tyr and Odin pushed Ragnaros back into his volcanic lair in the east, in a land of boiling acid seas and skies choked with ash, the two keepers defeated the Fire Lord. Meanwhile, Arcadeus and Freya unleashed their powers upon Therizane the Stone Mother. To protect herself and her minions, the elemental ruler retreated into the towering stone spire that she called home. Arcadeus used his dominion over the earth to weaken the citadel's foundations and shatter the craggy giants who guarded it. Freya then made colossal roots sprout from the ground to entangle the fortress. They wormed through stone and crystal, buckled the citadel's walls and brought them down on Therizane's head. Ra, Thorim, and Hodir waged war with Alakir, the Windlord. Using their mastery over the skies and storms, they forced the Elemental Lord back to his lair among the highest peaks of Azeroth. Lightning set the heavens aflame as Alakir struggled to hold off his foes. In the end, the three keepers turned the elemental lord's own power against him, defeating Alakir atop his lofty domain. Neptalon, the tide hunter, and his minions rushed to aid the other embattled elemental lords, but they were waylaid by Loken and Murmuron. The two keepers used their wits to harry and outmaneuver Neptalon's forces at every turn. Ultimately, Loken unleashed his arcane powers to freeze and shatter the water elemental's forms, while Murmuron crafted enchanted bonds to imprison Neptalon himself. Although the elemental lords had been defeated, the keepers knew that they could not utterly destroy the beings. The spirits of the elements were bound to Azeroth itself. If they were killed, their corporeal forms would simply manifest again in time. Ra soon found a solution. He set out to imprison the elementals, much as the great Sargeras had done to demons. Ra first called on the aid of the gifted Titan Forge sorceress Helia. They worked in concert to craft four interlinked domains within a pocket dimension known as the Elemental Plane. Ra and Helia then banished the elemental lords and nearly all of their servants to this enchanted prison realm. Ragnaros and his fire elementals were exiled to a smoldering corner of the elemental plain known as the Firelands. Therizane and the earth elementals were locked within the crystalline caverns of Deepholm. Alakir and the air elementals were imprisoned among the cloudly spires 
of the sky wall. Lastly, Neptalon and the water elementals were sucked into the fathomless depths of the abyssal maw. Only a few elementals would remain on the surface of Azeroth. With their leaders gone, these beings scattered and abandoned the war. Having contained the elementals, the Keepers turned their attention to the Black Empire's Akiri legions. Many of the insectoids dwelled in vast catacombs that snaked beneath the surface of the devastated world. Arcadeus bent the stones and soil to his will, collapsing the Akiri burrows and driving the creatures above ground. Upon emerging from their lairs, the insectoids found themselves surrounded by the Titan Forged. The battles between the Titan Forged and the Akir proved unexpectedly vicious. In time, the Keepers destroyed most of the Akiri race. Small pockets of the insectoids those that had tunneled deep underground, escaped the Keeper's wrath. Yet, they were too weakened to mount a counterattack. The victories over the Akir and the Elementals heartened the Keepers, but they knew that their greatest battles were still to come. As one, they turned their righteous gaze the heart of the Black Empire, the sprawling temple city built around the old god Yasuraj. By toppling the most powerful Naraki bastion on Azeroth, the Keepers believed they could crush their enemies in one swift stroke. The Keepers and their allies waded through one swarm of Naraki after another as they battled their way toward the mountainous form of Yasuraj. The broken and mangled bodies of Titanforged and Naraki alike riddled the landscape by the time the invaders breached the city and assaulted the old god itself. Yasuraj was more powerful than the Keepers had expected. It poisoned the minds of the Titanforged, drawing out their fears and darkening their thoughts. The Pantheon grew concerned that the old god would overwhelm their servants. Despite the risk of harming the world, they decided to take direct action. Amunthul himself reached down through Azeroth's stormy skies and took hold of Yashuraj's writhing body. With a heave of his mighty arm, he tore the old god from the crust of the world. In that moment, Yashuraj's gargantuan bulk was ripped apart. The immensity of the old god's death rattle shattered mountaintops and obliterated hundreds of titan forged where they stood. Yasuraj was dead, but its tendrils had bored more deeply through Azeroth than Amunthul had ever imagined. In excising the old god from the world, he had inadvertently ripped an eternal wound in Azeroth's surface. Volatile arcane energies, the lifeblood of the nascent titan, erupted from the scar and roiled out across the world. Horrified by this turn of events, the Pantheon realized they could not risk killing the other old gods in such a manner. The malignant creatures had embedded themselves so deep into the world, tearing them out 
would destroy Azeroth itself. The Pantheon knew that the only course of action was to imprison the old gods where they lay and contain their evil forever. It would be a difficult task, but it would be possible with the aid of the Keepers. At the Pantheon's behest, the Titanforge devised a plan to shatter the last vestiges of the Black Empire forever. They would battle each of the old gods directly. Once they had weakened the creatures, Arcadeus would create subterranean chambers to contain them. Mimiron would then fashion colossal machineries to lock the old gods in place. When this work was done, Loken would imbue each prison with a great enchantment that would neutralize the old gods' evil. With their plans formed, Titan Forged began their campaign. Great battles tore across the land as the Titan Forged fought their way southeast to the bastion of Nazoth. After overwhelming the old god, the keepers used their powers to encase the creature in an underground prison. Next, the Titan Forge marched southwest to the sprawling temple city that had grown around the third old god, Cthun. The keepers and their allies purged swarms of Naraki before assaulting the old god itself and subduing it. Much as they had done with Nazoth, the keepers entombed the entity beneath the earth and constructed a prison of their own devising over its form. Only one old god remained, the vicious and cunning yogg Suran. It would not fall so easily. As the Titan Forge closed in on Yogg-Suron's crumbling northern stronghold, the old god unleashed the greatest of its generals, the Cthraxi. The Cthraxi were monstrous warbringers, larger and more resilient than other Naraki. They possessed great strength and brutal intellect and their dark powers and maledictions could drive even the titan forged to madness. The giant, tentacle-faced Cthraxi whipped the remnants of the Black Empire into a frenzy. They swarmed the titan forged on all sides, thinning their ranks. By the time the Keepers and their allies reached yogg Saron, their forces were greatly diminished. They found that they lacked the strength of numbers to defeat the old god. yogg Saron would have destroyed the Titan Forged if not for the heroic efforts of Odin. Although scarred and battered by war, Odin summoned his waning strength and inspired the Titan Forged to launch a counterattack. He commanded Loken to weave a grand illusion spell that forced the Cthraxi to see themselves and even yogg Suran as the enemy. As the Black Empire's forces turned on one another, Odin swooped in to cut down his confused foes. The other Titan Forged followed his lead, and together they succeeded in pacifying yogg Saron. As they had done with Cthun and Nazoth, the Keepers buried the entity beneath the earth, locking it away in a monolithic enchanted prison. For the first time in Azeroth's history, a tentative peace settled over the world. The 
Titan Forge had banished the chaotic elemental lords to another plane of existence. They had also purged the Black Empire and muted the terrible power of the old gods. Against all odds, Azeroth had been saved. But there was much work to be done. The Keeper's most pressing concern was the horrific scar left behind when Amon Thul had torn Yah Siraj from the world's crust. The constant stream of volatile arcane energy bled from this colossal rift, lashing out across the world. The Keepers knew that if left unattended, these energies would consume Azeroth over time. The Keepers labored day and night, crafting magical wards around the gaping wound to staunch the escaping lifeblood. Eventually, the tumultuous energies calmed and settled into balance. All that remained of the scar was an immense lake of scintillating energy that the Keepers would call the Well of Eternity. Thereafter, the power of this wondrous fount would be infused in the ailing world, helping life to take root and bloom across the globe. With the wound healed, the Keepers sought to strengthen Azeroth's nascent world soul and stabilize its life force. To do so, Arcadeus and Memoron combined their powers to craft the Forge of Wills and the Forge of Origination. These two extraordinary machines would work in tandem infusing Azeroth's slumbering spirit with cosmic energies. The Forge of Wills would be embedded in the northern reaches of the world, and it would shape the world soul's budding sentience. The Forge of Origination would be installed in the southern reaches of Azeroth, and it would regulate the rhythms of the deep earth and fortify the world soul's form. After these two machines were constructed, the keepers went to work. Odin oversaw efforts to install the Forge of Will within a vast northern mountain range that would become known as the Storm Peaks. The Pantheon appointed Odin the prime designate for his valorous deeds in the war with the old gods. The task of watching over yogg surans prison and maintaining the Forge of Wills would fall to him. Odin and the other keepers immediately began building the great fortress of Olduar to serve as the main bastion of the Titan Forge on Azeroth. The fortress would house not only yogg surans prison, but also the Forge of Wills and other machineries of the Keeper's devisings. The Forge of Wills also served another purpose. It could draw on the life essence of Azeroth itself, giving shape and sentience to creatures of living stone and metal. Not only giants, but other types of Titan Forged as well. This new generation of Titan Forged would help the Keepers bring order to this world. As the Forge of Wills churned out these new Titan Forged, High Keeper Ra led an expedition to install the Forge of Origination in the south. He was accompanied by a number of stone-skinned creatures recently wrought from the Forge of Wills. The Anubisath Giants, the Leonine Tolvir, and the indomitable Mogu. 
En route, Ra discovered the remnants of Yasaraja's corporeal form lay strewn across the southern reaches of the world. When Amanthul had ripped the old god from Azeroth, pieces of the entity had fallen back to the surface, infusing the land with evil. The largest intact piece of Yasharaj was the old god's icy heart, a mass of diseased flesh seething with void energies. Rather than destroy the heart, Ra built a subterranean vault to contain it and neutralize its evil. He, along with the other keepers, knew that studying the heart could help them understand the nature of the old gods and of other void creatures. Ra charged his Mogu followers with watching over the vault of Yashuraj. They would guard and care for the surrounding land as well. Ra then continued his expedition and traveled west. There, he and his followers embedded the forge of origination in the land. The earth rumbled beneath Ra's feet as the gargantuan machine churned to life. The High Keeper soon sensed that the twin forges were working in synergy, sending healing energies through the heart of the world. Ra and his followers erected a sprawling fortress around the Forge of Origination. This site was called Old Doom, and it would become the southernmost base of operations for the Keepers. Much like the Forge of Wills, the Forge of Origination would serve a dual purpose. In the event that Azeroth's flora and fauna succumbed to corruption, the incredible energies stored inside the Great Machine could be unleashed to eradicate all life on the world, allowing it to start anew. High Keeper Ra commanded some of the Tolvir and Anubisaths to safeguard Old Doom forever. He and the rest of his servants marched northwest into a land later known as Silithus. This arid and inhospitable region was home to the subterranean prison that housed the old god Cthulhu. Ra and his allies labored to expand on the prison, ultimately constructing the mighty fortress of Ankuraj. After the task was done, the High Keeper ordered his remaining Titan forged to safeguard the stronghold. Ra himself, seeing his work completed, would spend the following ages roaming the southern regions of Azeroth, distantly observing his titan forged and ensuring that they upheld their sacred charges. With the twin forges embedded in Azeroth, the keepers moved to reshape the surface of the world. To this end, they called on the new generation of servants wrought from the Forge of Wills. Each of these loyal and mighty Titan Forged would play a different role in ordering and protecting the world. The craggy and kind-hearted Earthen would specialize in crafting mountains and carving out the deep places of the world. The clockwork mechanomes, designed by Keeper Mimoron, would help build and maintain the Keeper's extraordinary machineries. The stone-skinned Mogu would dig out the myriad rivers and waterways of Azeroth. 
the task of safeguarding many of the keeper's holdings would fall to two different groups of constructs, the iron-skinned vehicle and the chiseled tolvir. To shape the environment, the keepers also conscripted the powerful stone and sea giants. They would roam the breadth of Azeroth, lifting towering mountain ranges and dredging out the fathomless seas. As the Titan Forged began reshaping Azeroth, Keeper Freya set out to populate the world with organic life. To do so, she crafted the Emerald Dream a vast and ever-shifting dimension of spirits and nature magic. This ethereal plane acted as a mirror image of Azeroth, helping regulate the evolutionary path of the world's flora and fauna. A confluence of spirits and strange, otherworldly beings populated the dream frolicking in the surreal paradise that was their home. The mystical dream defied mortal perceptions of reality. Concepts like time and distance held no sway within this realm of intangibles. A day on the physical world could feel like decades in the dream. Freya then wandered the world, searching for areas where the well of eternity's energies had coalesced. These regions created optimal conditions for the development of new flora and fauna. Freya shaped immense enclaves of nature at these places of power. She molded life of astounding diversity seeding it around the world. The sites where Freya had done her work were located at the polar extremes of the world. They included regions that would later become known as Ungoro Crater, Sholazar Basin, and the Vale of Eternal Blossoms. The greatest creatures to emerge from these enclaves were colossal animals known as the Wild Gods. Freya adored and cared for these majestic beings as if they were her very own children. She often wandered the physical world with the Wild Gods at her side, vibrant forests and grasslands blooming in their footsteps. Yet there was one place she and the wild gods frequented more than any other, a massive forested peak called Mount Hajal. It was on the slopes of Hajal that Freya bound the spirits of her beloved wild gods to the Emerald Dream, inexorably tied to the ethereal realm. They would come to symbolize the health and vitality Azeroth itself. Forever after, Hyjal would remain a refuge and sacred place to the wild gods. As Freya's creations explored the world, they came across a number of other strange life forms. These creatures had emerged from Azeroth's elemental past of their own free will. When the keepers had sealed off the elemental plane, some stragglers had escaped banishment. The fury of these spirits had ebbed over time. They'd become creatures of flesh and blood. It was from these formal elementals that some forms of wildlife, such as proto-dragons, came to be. In time, the keepers and their servants stabilized Azeroth's main landmass, a continent that teemed with plants and creatures of every kind. 
twilight fell as the Titan Forge surveyed the world they had shaped. And they named the primary continent Kalimdor, which meant land of eternal starlight. Pleased with the Keeper's efforts, and assured that the slumbering world soul was in good hands, the Pantheon prepared to venture back into the great dark. The discovery of Azeroth was proof that other nascent titans could exist in the universe, and the titans were eager to renew their search. The Keepers mourned the imminent departure of their makers, but they also brimmed with pride at being given the honor of safeguarding Azeroth. To commemorate the Pantheon's departure, Lokin and Mimiron crafted a set of enchanted artifacts called the Discs of Norganon, which would transcribe history as it unfolded on Azeroth. If the Pantheon ever returned, they would possess a record of what had come to pass in their absence. In his final act before departing, Amon Thul commissioned the constellar Algalon, the Observer, to serve as the world's celestial guardian. The possibility that the world soul could become corrupted was one the Titans could not ignore. Should that come to pass, Algalon had the power to initiate a procedure that would activate the Forge of Origination, purging the world of life and any corruption that was present. With that, the Pantheon bade the Titan Forge to farewell and disappeared into the stars. The Titans had done everything possible to heal Azeroth and assure the world soul's maturation. All that remained now was to wait and hope that the world soul would one day awaken.